Hey everyone, Robin Kerr is back for another installment on Motion VFX's Nflare version 2. If you haven't already, I'd recommend checking out the first few clips on the subject, where so far I've used a standard preset for a simple keyframe animation, but also made my own flare and touched on the built-in tracker and the first few amazing animation tools that Mflare has to offer. Now I want to show you a few of the remaining options with which you can achieve some even more amazing looking flares and effects. To start things off, we want to look at another quick example where both the tracking and brightness tracking are incredibly cool tools to have. I have a couple of classic sunset clips here with heavy moving cameras. This first one with this family out for a jog actually already has a bit of a flare, but I want to enhance it with an even heavier flare to give it that little bit more depth. Ironically, it actually has both a flare and some dirt, or orbs as mflare calls them, which by the way shows us once again what a great job motion VFX have done with simulating flares and everything that might go with them. So for starters, I'm going to go to my effects browser and apply a flare from the mflare2 category. And I want something a little more extreme on purpose this time, so we can really see the results pop. Scrolling down to the off-screen theme, I think I'll grab the last one, Sunlit Sky, since this seems pretty appropriate, but also because it has some nice big iris flares. And drag it onto my clip. I'll just leave it at its default settings for now and concentrate on the track. Since we know that even if we were to replace it with a whole new flare later, that tracking information would carry over to the new one. But skimming through the clip a bit, we can see that the sun isn't in fact visible the whole time, so tracking it isn't actually an option. But at the same time, we can see that there really isn't anything along the same plane that isn't covered at some point or another, except maybe some of the clouds. But the problem is perspective. If we were to track something too far away from the actual source, not only would the position not match, but we also have a lot of relative rotation that would make for even more of a mismatch. But thanks to the brilliant underlying Mocha tracker, all of this isn't even that big of an issue. Skimming through the clip again, I can see that I do have a certain constant and even one that is roughly on the same plane as the sun, the trees in the background from what looks like an island. So all I need to do is decide on whether I want to start in the middle, as I did the last time, and work my way back and forth, or just start at the beginning and go from there. Like I said, I really just need a point or points as close to the sun as possible that are visible long enough that I don't have to reposition the tracker every other frame. So I'll simply activate the tracker by clicking the tracker button. And since the clip pans right, I'll start with these tree tops close to the girl's face. Obviously, I can completely ignore the flare itself at this point, and the fact that it's making it look like we're on a planet from Star Wars with two suns. Now, just start the track. And since I know that the track will fail at some point through obstruction, I'll just hover over the stop button and click it when it does. Now I'll go back as far as needed to the frame just before the track fails. Position my playhead there and simply look for another point, again as close to the sun as possible. And restart the track, which overwrites the previously failed track data from here on. and just rinse and repeat until I get to the end of the clip. And once it's all done, all I have to do is deactivate my tracker, look for the sun anywhere in the clip, and reposition my flare over it. I'll pick a spot just above the treetops. Maybe I'll even click edit and deactivate the first glow and glint elements since we already have a nice real glow. And play it back. And there you go. A perfect track, even though I reoriented the tracker several times. No jumps or anything. Something your usual point tracker can only dream about. Love it. 
Of course, looking back on it, it also tracks through our joggers. So we'll just go back into the inspector, back down to our animation, and then track brightness. And turn this on. Now, like magic, my flare disappears behind the joggers. I especially love how it only slightly blinks when the girl's head only covers it for a short moment. This is just not something you would want to have to do by hand. We can even go in and change the sources or the points position without changing or losing our track at any point. Now that we have our flare integrated perfectly into our image in terms of movement, let's see what other options M Flare gives us to liven things up a bit, as well as fine tune and integrate our flare even more if needed. Going back to the inspector, we see a section titled Post Effects that we can show by clicking the button on the right. With that, we get a list of six additional parameters that are at our disposal for fine tuning the look of our flare. First off, we can introduce additional chromatic aberration to the entire flare. If I increase the aberration by something around 0.2 or 3, we see that that takes a bit of the edge off of our iris elements, but also distorts the sparkle elements nicely. Of course, if I just wanted to affect the one or the other, I could simply add some to either individually in the edit pane, but using these global settings is in fact noticeably less computationally intensive. But I actually like the result of both. Next we have hue. Should I want to shift the hue of everything? Which, along with almost all the other parameters in this section, is of course keyframable if I wanted to animate it over time. Below that, we can adjust this saturation individually for the flare, as well as add some overall blur if wanted below that. But you could also use an individual elements smoothing parameter, which is also less computationally intensive should performance or render times actually become a problem. Next, we have grain settings, which are great since an overly smooth lens flare added to a noisy clip will look unrealistic, whereby in general, there's really always some grain present in any video. So it's of course a huge help that I can adjust my flare's grain to match the grain in my clip via its intensity, size, and speed settings to integrate it that much better into my footage. Great addition. And lastly, if for whatever reason the resolution of the flare isn't high enough for our liking, we can double it here in the advanced section of the post effects, of course at the cost of diminished performance with more complex flares. If I close the post effects section, we can look at my favorite section, animation, by showing its settings. We're already familiar with the last option, the track brightness, but above that, we have two other very useful animations. At the top, we have the flicker settings. Flipping these open, we see we have four parameters to choose from. This, as the name states, introduces a flicker into our flare's brightness. With that, we can simulate, for example, the flare maybe just barely skimming through the leaves of the tree that it's over. So we can essentially introduce yet another organic level to our animation with just a few simple clicks. The speed setting decides how often per second the brightness fluctuates. The amplitude determines how much the brightness varies each time, in which case this value is the amount more and or less the brightness value varies relative to its current setting. So at this default setting of 50, the brightness could go from anywhere between 50 and 150, since the current setting is 100. The noisiness value, on the other hand, decides how random these amplitude values are calculated. So basically, a value of zero would result in more or less a steady pulsating flare. And the random seed value merely changes the value by which the noise or randomness is calculated. So for even more random randomness, I guess. So I want to add some flicker, but since this is a slow motion shot, I wouldn't want a very high speed, so I'll set it to something like 30. But to really make it obvious for our little demo here, I'll crank up the amplitude a bit, say somewhere around 80. A noise and seed of 5 and 0 is fine by me, so I'll just leave them. Let's play that back. Yep, we have ourselves a really nice fluctuating flare, giving the shot that much more life. And again with just a few clicks of the mouse. 
For this last parameter, dynamic animation, let's look at the next clip in our timeline, since it's far more suited. In this clip, we see a little kid riding his bike, and the camera pans across following him, where we see yet another sun pass through the frame. Again, I want to start by dragging a flare from my effects browser, and again, for demonstration purposes, I'm going to select a bit more of an extreme flare so that we can see the results that much easier. Any one of the flares with sun in it, once again, would be great, but I think I'll just go with one of the first ones to make things easy. This one may have even been made by JJ himself. Well, maybe not. So to once again reiterate how brilliant the built-in tracker is, I'm actually going to track the sun even after it has left the frame. I'll start with the sun over his right shoulder and start tracking backwards. And once it's left the frame, I'll simply reposition the tracker to track something else roughly on the same plane, such as the clouds. After reaching the beginning of the clip, I can go to where the sun is over his left shoulder and do the same until I reach the end of the clip. Then just go back again to fill the gaps in the middle with the same system where the sun passes behind the kid. Once I'm done, much like our last example, I simply reposition the flare to be over the sun. And with that, if we quickly skim through the clip, I've effectively tracked the sun's position across the entire clip without even being able to see it half the time. That's pretty powerful. I could of course go in and activate the brightness tracking in my animation settings to have it pass behind the kid on his bike, but we've already seen that a couple of times, and we want to look at the dynamic animation option above it. Because this, for me, is one of the most clever options of all for making flares like this that extra bit more convincing. Because even if a flaring light source leaves the frame, it'll still hit the lens of the camera from this side for a while longer, therefore won't disappear the exact same moment the light source does. But rather, it'll disappear past a certain angle that it hits the lens. And I effectively have the actual position of the sun outside of the frame via my track. I could, of course, simply estimate the moment when the flare begins to fade and keyframe it by hand, but that's where our dynamic animation comes in. I'll deactivate the tracker, and if I flip open the dynamic animation settings, a simple mode setting is revealed that is set to off by default. Clicking on the menu shows me the three other settings I have to choose from, off screen, on screen, and on border. Okay, so what do these mean? Well, they define a standard fade area around my frame. I'll select the first one off screen. Now, to better understand what this means and does, we have to do two things. One, hit Command minus a couple times to zoom the viewer back a bit. And two, click the last checkbox under the dynamic animation settings labeled preview. With that, if we look really closely, I can activate two squares. A blue one around my frame, and a gray one much further out. The blue one is the fade offset, and the gray box the fade range. The same two parameters that we see under our mode menu. In this mode, the blue frame marks the area in which the flare is at 100% opacity. So as long as it's inside this box, nothing changes. The gray box, on the other hand, marks the point at which the flare will be at zero opacity. So the closer my flare gets to this box, or line, the more it fades out. If I skim through my clip, then we can see it doesn't really affect much in the beginning, and only mildly fades towards the end, because the box is too far out. To change this, I can do one of two things, either reduce the range slider, and we see the box shrink. Or I can just simply click and drag the box to the desired position. So if I wanted to make sure that the flare fades away completely at both the beginning and end as it enters and leaves the frame, I can just skim to the beginning of the clip and simply drag the gray frame until it's inside the position of the source point that I can see. And with that, it gets a fairly short fade period on both ends. I could, of course, just as well reference the position of the flare at the end of the clip, giving it a longer fade period. But I could also just simply click and drag the blue box to increase or decrease the point at which the fade starts. 
So you can see the options are endless and incredibly flexible. With this, I don't have to guess at how long it might take at the one side to fade out or how much at the other, but rather the actual position data. And with that, the velocity of the flare defines it for me. It doesn't get cooler or easier than that. To add to our fade, we even have two additional options in the fade animation menu in the inspector under our offset. If I set it to boost and crank boost level up a bit and preview that, then my flare gets a boost in brightness by the amount specified around the midpoint between the offset and range boxes. Similar to the noise setting in the same menu. If I select this, it introduces some brightness noise or flicker to the flare between the range and offset points before it fades out which could, for example, suggest some movement off frame, as if someone or something is blocking the path to the light source. The other two modes merely define different range and offset points. On screen basically inverts the two so that the fade range is inside the offset. And on border defines two range areas one on the inside and one on the outside of the offset. That move concentrically to each other when changed. So again, a lot of really clever thought put into the functionality of Mflare 2. Last but certainly not least, up next, we're going to check out the cool motion only options that Mflare 2 has to offer in Motion 5 in conjunction with Motion's own virtual lights. Very cool stuff, and I hope you stick around to see it. Up next, if not, thanks for watching. I hope you liked it, and be sure to check out the description for further infos and links for Motion VFX's Mflare version 2.